this morning our media team was praying and we just felt so strongly that peace and joy were gonna fill this room so beautifully. And I was sitting there and it was like for the first time, I was like, I was once dead. We were all once dead. And because of Jesus, not because of what we did, not because of our good works, but because of Jesus, we are made alive. Because of Jesus, we have everlasting life. And literally it was like what was dead in me just started coming alive. And so I just felt so strongly, I'm gonna speak this scripture over us, but I just thought I felt so strongly that thankfulness, we're gonna fill our hearts and through the thankfulness of what God has done, the situations that we thought we never could get through, He got us through. All the things, there's so much to be thankful for. So I'm gonna read Psalm 16 over you, and then I'm gonna pray and we're gonna head into worship. You have made known to me the path of life. He made known to us the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Can we all just lift our hands as an act of surrender? Oh Jesus, we thank you that in your presence there is fullness of joy, that what is broken can be fixed in a moment, who is dead in this room can be alive in a moment, Lord. So God, we just thank you, Lord. What is there not to be thankful for? There's so much to be thankful for. Let's just hear praise and thanksgiving out of our lips. Jesus, we can't love you without you, God. So Lord, we just thank you. Holy Spirit, would you permeate in our hearts, Jesus, who you are? And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for everything you're gonna do today. God, may you be high and lifted up. We look at the spotless lamb today. We look at the cross today. It's in your great name we pray, amen.
this morning. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. We love you. We adore you. We adore you, Jesus. Master, Savior, precious Jesus. Precious.
we've come to love you today. We've come to love you. We've come to pour our love on you. I thank you that you're here. Thank you that you know us better than anyone, better than we know ourselves. know the needs of everyone in the room, everyone watching. Lord, so we open our hearts to you today. We open our hearts to you. If we need healing, we open our heart to you. If we need freedom, we open our heart to you. If we've come in anxious, we open our heart to you. Come in tired or weary, we open our heart to you. Come touch us today, Lord. We don't want to leave the same. Don't let it be just another Sunday. Let us encounter you. We are hungry to encounter you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Why don't we just lift a shout of praise to the Lord? Why don't we just thank Him for the cross? Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the beauty of the cross. We will never know how much it cost. We'll never know, Lord, but we're thankful. We're thankful 
that we can be here today, that we can worship you today because of the cross, because of your blood. So thank you, Jesus, thank you. Thank you from our hearts we say thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We can thank the worship team. Thank you, choir. The beauty of the cross. As we kept singing that, I'll never know how much it cost. May we just get a glimpse today. May we get a glimpse today. Just a quick announcement. But I think it's pertinent because as we just worshiped, I know VBS is coming. And the theme of VBS this year is Levitical worship. And so we can come in here as adults and worship and experience the presence of the Lord like that. And that's what your kids are going to be taught these upcoming weeks at VBS. So you can register today. You can scan the QR code for more information. But the Holy Spirit wants to encounter our kids in the same way he wants to encounter us. So it's going to be not just a regular VBS They're really going to be taught the things of the Lord. They're going to be taught in scriptures how to worship and how to minister to him. We're going to step into tithe this morning. Amen. You ready to give? You ready to give? Come on. I'm going to read from Psalm 96, beginning at verse 7. Actually, I'm going to begin at verse 6. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. In verse 8, it says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. How can we ever measure the glory due his name? It's, it's immeasurable what he's worth. And so we come in with worship. We come in to pour our love on him. And now we get to come and we get to present an offering, something of our resources outside of just our arms stretched in love and adoration. Now we get to come and bring the fruit of what he's given us. And so this morning, as as we behold the beauty of the cross, as we remember what he did for us, let's bring him the glory due his name in the matter of our resources. Amen. Let's bring him something costly because he asked for it, and that's full obedience unto him, not just our words and our song, but our very finances as well because it's from him, and we get to give right back to him. So I'm going to pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you to be in this room, to be in this building, to be in your house today, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, for you responding to our worship, Lord. And now we want to bring you something more. We want to bring you something that you're worthy of, Jesus. So would you just speak to every heart, Lord? Would you just search us? Would you search us, Lord? We wanna wanna give what you're worthy of. We know that this offering doesn't even come close. What we put in these buckets into your hands doesn't even come close, Lord. But we wanna respond to you in the room today, Lord. So just bless everyone that gives. Bless and meet every need, Jesus. We honor you. We honor your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're in the room and you need an envelope, you can lift your hands. Our ushers will come. You can also text the number on the screen. If you're watching online, we invite you to give as well. You can text the number that's on your screen, and we will be back in just a moment. You guys can rush the buckets.
Hey guys, Michael and Jessica here. We love you. We miss you so much. We will be home soon. Screaming. Okay, I can't. I'm not. This is. So, I can't. No. <laughs> All right, run with this one. No. No. <laughs> this is. <laughs> we have tried to do this video like five times. My I guess we're just gonna me. go with it. I guess I'm talking too loud in your ears. We're just gonna keep it. This is us. 
just take it or leave it. Um, we really miss you guys. We will be home soon and we're having an amazing time with the kids. Oh, just feeling so refreshed and can't wait to be home. There's really no place like home, but we have the honor today of having Lo and Michael Miller from Upper Room with us today. They left their church family to come be with us and we're just so incredibly honored to have them. Yeah, Michael and Lo, thank you so much for being with us. It it means more than you know. We honor you. Uh, we yes. can't think of an, another couple that we trust more. And so we know that this is going to be a very sacred and special day. Yes. Michael and Lo are leading an incredible church, uh, hosting the presence of God. And uh, can we all stand and welcome our dear friends, Michael and Larissa Miller. Thank you guys. What a treat. I couldn't, we couldn't hear what they were saying because you were clapping before we got up here. So thank you guys for that. That was uh, such a blessing. Michael and Jess are uh, two of our favorite people on the planet. I'm so glad they're getting away uh, for a few weeks. Um, it's really needed and important. So uh, Michael and Jess, we love you. Hopefully you're watching. If you're not, actually, hopefully, hopefully you're, you're not, not. watching. <laughs> Uh, hopefully he's on a golf course or by a pond or doing something, but um, we are really honored to be here this morning. Yeah, good morning. Hi. <laughs> you want me to pray for you? Please. Yes. Yeah, so would y'all extend your hand with me, Father? We thank you for a word in season. We thank you so much for your presence here, Lord. We thank you right now, and we ask that you would prepare us yes, to receive, Lord, from you through Michael today, God. We ask, Lord, collectively for ears to hear, for eyes to see, for a heart to receive. Lord, we thank you for the anointing that you've given him, God. We bless you, Jesus. Open the eyes of our hearts today to see you rightly, Lord, to, to respond to you yes. as you're worthy of Jesus. Amen. And if you would just present your heart before the Lord. Um, I saw the Lord with an exacto knife, and uh, I, f I really felt like he was going to get very precise with some of you um, and, and do heart surgery that there's subtle influences from the pain of your past. And this morning, the Lord is not only going to uh, show you that he delivered you from your past, but that he's healed you. It's not just about being delivered from, but, but Lord, it's unto wholeness, it's unto healing. And I believe Holy Spirit you're going to heal hearts. Lord, our heart is the wellspring of our life. It's the source of our existence. It's the filter in which we view and see all things. And so we know that you purchased a whole heart for each one of us. So we present to you our hearts. Just bring your heart before the Lord. Moses said this in Psalms 90. He said, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And I think one of the most powerful acts of worship is presenting the work of the Lord to him by showing him a whole heart. Lord, look at what your work has done in my heart. Look at what my heart has been through. But Lord, the, the fingerprints upon my heart are yours. They're not the pain of yesterday. They're not what my heart's been through, but what you've provided for me, Lord. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that where there's walls, you'll walk through them. Where there's, where there's uh, broken hearts, you'll bind them up, Lord. I know that you're close to the brokenhearted. And Lord, you said don't lose heart. And so where we've lost heart, I pray that you would impart courage. Where fear is inside of hearts, would perfect love come and confront and eradicate fear in Jesus' name. But Lord, you could live anywhere 
anywhere, literally, and you chose our hearts. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he who spoke light into darkness spoke the knowledge of his glory in the face of his son into your heart. That Genesis 1 was prophetic of what he was going to do inside of you. Let there be light. And if there's any darkness in our hearts, Lord, would you shine the knowledge of your glory and the face of your son into those places so that, that we can see you and know you rightly, but so that, and also so that others can see and know you rightly. So Holy Spirit, we give you the freedom, permission, and the lordship to come and do what only you can this morning. Uh, we pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Amen. Um, thank you, baby. I, uh, this is my beautiful bride. I love her so much. Um, thank you, honey. Hey, it is, it is, it is, I just want to say once again, it's, it's like being with family. So um, I don't know of a church that's more kindred uh, to the upper room in Dallas uh, than, than this one. And uh, two leaders that are building and pursuing uh, something in such a similar vein and fashion as Michael and Jess. And so I feel like I'm with family. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, we are pastoring a community in Dallas, Texas. It's, in the, it's next to downtown. I'm in the warehouse district. It's called the design district uh, that started out as a, a prayer meeting, really in a church planting graveyard. And we just began ministering to the Lord uh, hosting his presence. And um, as we built a home for him, uh, people started to, uh, they were transformed. A lot of millennials that had walked away from the church um, rediscovered the beauty of the church and the beauty of the head of the church, Jesus, over the last uh, 13 years. So, um, yeah, it's really, really cool to have family in Orlando. You have family in Dallas. And I really started diving into the topic of forgiveness and its importance for us as believers. Uh, I, I think that forgiveness is something that, you know, I, I learned a long time ago. Uh, it, it's, it's how I got into the kingdom. But the truth is, is that forgiveness isn't just how you got into the kingdom. Forgiveness is the oxygen that you breathe in the kingdom, that, that that ducks quack, dogs bark, and Christians give and forgive. <laughs> it's what we do. We, we forgive. And I had not realized the pain of some of the things in my past that I hadn't fully uh, given to the Lord and released. And I think for us to move ahead, we have to tap into the supernatural power of forgiveness because our culture is... Uh, fading, it, it, is, it is fading in this virtue. Tim Keller just wrote a book called Forgiveness, and he, he says that America is, um, is in decline when it comes to forgiveness, that forgiveness was central because the Bible was central and forgiveness is central to this book. But as this moves to the peripheral of our society, so does the topic of forgiveness. And actually, if you're a victim in our current culture, you're given status, you're given a platform. So to, to issue forgiveness to anyone that has wronged you, it actually de-incentivizes you to forgive because of the platform and the status that you have. Are you with me? It's like cancel culture. It's, it's very powerful, but it's so anti-kingdom. And, and so I, I want to just maybe dive in a little bit into uh, your heart and just see if there may be areas of unforgiveness, areas where bitterness has taken root, and that we surrender that to the Lord and get wholehearted today. Is that cool? Um, so if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Numbers chapter 15. Put your finger there, and then let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be in those two places. Numbers 15, Ephesians 4, excuse me, Ephesians 4, verse 26. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, verse 26. It says, be angry. Everyone say, be angry. be angry. Do you know the Bible says it's okay to be angry? <laughs> be angry. Angry is a natural response to pain. If you're wronged, 
if someone else is wronged, a secondary emotion to that wrong is, is anger. Now, Paul continues, he says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So in the day of pain, in the day of trouble, anger is a natural response, yet Paul says you need to deal with your anger in that moment. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Or do not give the devil a foothold, and this is speaking about in your heart, that, that anger actually, if it's not dealt with correctly, opens the door for the devil's foot to come inside of your heart. And, and when the devil has a foothold in your heart, that becomes a motivator, and this is the next two things. He says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only a word as is good for edification according to the need for the moment, so that it will give grace to the hearer. So it's an action and indeed, don't steal, don't, don't let unwholesome talk come out of you. This is the fruit of harbored anger. And then look at this, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then it says, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. So this to me is a process I see of anger aging inside a heart. Now, anger ages like milk. Milk sours over time, and when anger is harbored in a soul, a soul becomes sour, and aged anger actually turns into bitterness. Bitterness is the result of the sun going down on the anger that happened in a day, and that anger that happened in a day, as you hold on to it, a day turns into week, week turns into months, months turns into years, and before you know it, your, your persona is actually filtered with a spirit of bitterness. Like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this. Can you throw that up there, Hebrews 12, 15? It says, uh, see to it, yeah, here we go. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble for by it many are defiled. So this is uh, one of the things the grace of God has afforded to us is that the grace of God's work in us uproots any bitterness that aged anger has produced inside of us. And Paul is exhorting them, don't fall short of the grace lest this root sets in. And if this root sets in, it will cause trouble. And it will cause trouble for the one who is rooted in bitterness, but then it will defile anyone that gets around them. So, so the trouble, the only other time this word uh, is used right here where it says it causes trouble, it's Luke 6. And it talks about those that were troubled by demons, those that were troubled by demonic spirits. So there's this demonic tie to the devil getting a foothold inside of your heart by harboring anger. This root of bitterness comes forth and you end up not only coming under demonic oppression, but you defile those that come near you. And culturally, I don't think we've been given tools to really process the pain of the past and walk in the forgiveness that Paul instructs us here. Something very powerfully happened to me in 2018. I was 42 at the time, and my high school uh, baseball program, I played baseball in high school and college, and my high school for the first year, had this alumni baseball game. And so I came back and uh, I was excited. We were meeting old friends and I was up to the plate and I, I got a base hit. And as I got a base hit, I was rounding first and I heard this voice that I had not heard in 25 years. And he said, let's go, Mike. And I thought, oh my gosh, that voice. Let's go, Mike. And I was like, who's, he's here. And it was Coach Rowe, Coach Jimmy Rowe. And Coach Rowe wasn't a baseball coach. Coach Rowe was a basketball coach when I was in high school. And me and Coach Rowe had a history. 
because basketball was my first love. And my junior year, our team was supposed to be really good. There were high expectations. I was a starting point guard and we laid a dud that year. We did not accomplish what we were supposed to accomplish and the coach took out on me. Uh, he blamed me more or less for the, the bad season that we were having. I went from starting to, I ended up riding the bench and like the last you know, 10 seconds of a game, he would throw me in. And I remember one time, I think it was the last game or near the end of it, he tried to get me to go in and I was like, I'm not going in, the game's over. And uh, Coach Rowe was just fuming at Michael Miller and, and, and I went to play baseball, had a good baseball season. And so coming back my senior year, I went in and I had a conversation with Coach Rowe. He thought I was gonna come back to play and I said, Coach Rowe, I don't wanna play for you. Um, I don't wanna play for you. And he said, his response to me was, I don't want you to play for me either. <laughs> And, and we ended up having this feud a senior in high school and, and, and this, this basketball coach. And I was, I was extremely hurt uh, by the way that he coached me. Uh, I was extremely hurt by the way that um, he treated me my, my, my junior year and not playing basketball my senior year. So here I am 25 years later at this alumni baseball game and I hear this voice. And after the inning, Coach Rowe runs up to me. And he goes, Mike, Mike, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> well, Mike, it's been so long. What are you doing? I'm a pastor. <laughs> he goes, There's, no, you're a pastor. Where are you a pastor at? A church downtown. <laughs> now, you know, I am like, I am walled off and ready to move on. He said, what's the name of the church? And I said, it's, it's, it's Upper Room, Upper Room Dallas kind of looked up and he goes, I think my daughter goes to that church. And I thought, there's no way your daughter goes to my church. <laughs> like truthfully, I was like, there's no way. And he goes, yeah, she, she was on the mission field with Heidi Baker. And I was like, your daughter definitely goes to our church. Like, <laughs> yes. And, and so I didn't recognize, he said his daughter's name. I didn't recognize it uh, initially, but, um, uh, the next week, I was in our prayer room, and Carissa, his daughter, comes up to me and says, hey, I heard you met my, it's a stepdad, but I called him dad. I heard you met my dad, Coach Rowe. And I was like, I had no idea your dad was Coach Rowe. She goes, yeah, he really wants you to reach out to him. Can I give you his number? And I'm like, sure. So she gives me his number. I put it in my phone, and I mean, I'm, I'm done. I move on. Well, like six weeks later, I run into Carissa again, and uh, she goes, hey, uh, uh, coach, told me that you didn't reach out. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've been busy. And she said, well, he, he really wants you to reach out now. Um, he, he recently got a diagnosis, and he would like you to come and pray for him. And I said, well, what was the diagnosis? And well, they found uh, some can cancer, he has, he has bladder cancer. And so I, I sat down, and after she left, I sat down, and I, I didn't call him. I texted him. I'm like, I heard you got a report. I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. And immediately my phone rings. <laughs> I'm like, hey, coach, Mike, thank you for texting. I had to call. I said, I'm so glad you called. I heard about your diagnosis. And he said, Would you come out to my house and would you pray with me? And so. I said, sure, and uh, I was reluctant. I had this weird thing going on in my heart. And um, it took about a week for me to set the time up an appointment, but I went out and I visited Coach Rowe 25 years later after our junior year. He has a diagnosis. And there was something about, I think, the diagnosis that actually softened my heart to him. He was no longer this coach and authoritative, like, monster that I had him, but he was a broken man. And I walked into his living room and his wife, beautiful wife, beautiful chair, she, she left the room immediately. And we're sitting in these two recliners and he said, hey, before we talk about my diagnosis, I wanna to talk to you about something else. And I said, what's that coach? He said, I wanna to talk to you about your senior year in high school. I said, well, what do you wanna talk about? He goes, Mike, you didn't need a coach. 
you needed a father and I need you to forgive me. Here I am at 42, sitting in coach room, I just break down crying. And as I break down crying, he breaks down crying. And I said, you need to forgive me. I was a punk 17 year old. And we start hugging. His wife comes out with communion. And we took communion together. And we pray. And we start a new friendship. And from 2018 to 2020, uh, I got to talk to Coach almost once a month, if not more so. I uh, heard reports he was getting better and better and better. Um, but as cancer, just such a weird deal, he took a turn for the worst uh, the spring of 2020. And um, Jerry called me and said that Coach had been sent home on hospice about the time that uh, COVID hit, we were in quarantine. And I said, well, I'm still believing for a miracle. We were all believing for a miracle, and um, the miracle didn't come uh, the way that we thought it would. And in April of 2020, Coach passed. And uh, the day of his passing, Jerry called me. This is his wife, and said, hey, uh, Coach is with Jesus. I said, praise God, and we prayed on the phone. And um, she said, I, I have, I have, Coach wanted to ask you one thing. Um, if this happened, he didn't want to ask you before his death, but uh, there was one last thing he wanted from you, Mike. He, he wanted you to officiate his funeral. And so uh, while everyone was in quarantine of April of 2020, I went to a funeral home in North Texas. It was very small, and uh, it was just Coach Rose's family and maybe a friend or two and a camera, and they streamed it on Facebook. And I got to share this testimony that I just shared with you via Facebook, preached the gospel to thousands of his former students. Some were friends of mine who knew me but didn't know the story that had taken place, and many of them had had a similar experience with Coach Rowe, and they all got to encounter God's mercy and his love through what happened in our relationship. It was the power of forgiveness, the power of acknowledging the pain, acknowledging the blame, and then releasing them uh, Coach Rowe afforded me that in his living room when he said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me for the way I treated you your senior year? I had no idea I needed to forgive him in that capacity, but the Lord in his mercy and his tenderness wanted that root of bitterness out of my heart. You know, this is the context in which the Lord presents himself as healer. I told you to turn to Numbers chapter 15. In Numbers 15, I'm sorry, I, I do this all the time. I get Numbers and Exodus confused. It's Exodus 15. <laughs> and verse 22. And this is, this is a pr pretty significant moment um, in the Exodus story, uh, up until this point, up until verse 22, um, the Egyptians have been a main character in the narrative. The Egyptian slavery, deliverance from the Egyptians, um, they, were, they, were, they had such a large presence. And in Numbers chapter 15, at the beginning of it, um, there's this, this moment of worship where um, the Red Sea had crashed, uh, the Egyptians were killed, there was deliverance, and this, uh, this epic worship scene ensues. In fact, the first half of Exodus 15 is called the Song of Moses. And this was such a significant moment that we read of this song being sung in heaven in the book of Revelation. It says that the song of Moses is sung in heaven because of this moment. So this is a pretty extravagant worship moment. You got Miriam on the tambourine, she's dancing, and they're dancing because God has delivered them from 400 plus years of captivity. And in Exodus chapter one, verse 14, the Bible says that their lives, because of the Egyptians, were embittered. That because of their enslavement, because of the forced labor that they were under, that their lives were embittered. It was all that they knew 
was a life of bitterness because of the pain that was inflicted and the anger that they harbored towards those that enslaved them. Bitterness is all that they knew. In fact, Exodus 1 says uh, that they were embittered. Exodus 2 is an example of what bitterness had done to Moses, that Moses, in his anger, gets so mad at an Egyptian for abusing an Israelite that he kills him. He buries him. And then you see two Israelites later in that chapter arguing, and Moses confronts them. And then one of them says, are you going to treat us the same way you treated that Egyptian yesterday? And so Moses goes into hiding. Exodus 3, he's called from 40 years of being a shepherd, and then you have the Exodus account. So here in Exodus chapter 15, after deliverance has occurred, look at where the Lord takes Israel. This is so imperative for us to see. Look at verse 22, Exodus chapter 15. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. So when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. He threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statue and regulations, and there he tested them. Verse 26, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. This is the first time in the Bible that God describes himself as a healer. They had known him as deliverer. And there's a name, there's a specific name for God being a deliverer. It's Jehovah Methalt. That's him being a deliverer. But Jehovah Rapha is being introduced here in Exodus 15. And it reemphasizes the point that just because they had been delivered out of Egypt... Egypt hadn't been delivered out of them. Just because they had been delivered from the problem and the pain, the residue of that pain and the residue of that anger had not fully been healed and dealt with. And the Lord took them to the waters of bitterness because he wanted to put in their mouths the taste of what was inside of their hearts. He wanted to take them to the familiar, familiarity of the, the taste of bitterness and what they had been under the influence of for some 400 years because it had been passed down from generation to generation to generation. If you have a family feud, if there's a family feud, if there's hostility in a family and, and kids grow up around that hostility, it will only breed more hostility in the future generations. And all that these guys had known was systemic, systemic abuse from the Egyptians, which had rooted bitterness generationally in the Israelite people. And God immediately takes them to Mara and he says, listen, I need to heal your hearts from the pain of what they've been through. You can't take this into where I'm taking you. And this was a test for them. Now, they would not pass this test. <laughs> this generation would actually die in the wilderness. And God would raise up another generation led by Joshua, and they would go into the promised land. But in the same way, the Bible says, be angry. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. This is Hebrews chapter 3. It says, today, if you hear his voice, don't what? Harden your heart. This is the same account. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harbor what is within your heart when the voice of the Lord comes to take it out. <laughs> and so this is so crucial to see how he heals them of bitterness. In, in verse 25... When Moses cries out to the Lord, look how the Lord leads Moses to heal them of their bitterness, and he turns their bitterness into sweetness. In verse 25, he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And Moses cut down that tree 
and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Now, you know what this points to. It, it, it could have been anything. It could have been a reed. It could have been a tunic. It could have been anything that he threw into the water, but the Lord said, no, you're going to throw the tree into the water. And as he threw the tree into the waters, those bitter waters became sweet. And so here's what I started doing. I started asking the Lord, Lord, I, I think this is pointing to Calvary. There was a tree on Calvary. And, and the cross is the work of salvation, and the work of salvation is sufficient. It's sufficient f- to redeem us wholly. And so I started looking at the cross and doing a forensic on the death of Jesus, looking at what he endured and what he went through, and I thought, well, Lord, is bitterness a part of the cross? Where is bitterness a part of the cross? And as I started reading it, I, I found where bitterness is redeemed. And it's in Matthew 27. Because in Matthew 27, this is such a powerful moment. Uh, there was a drink offered to the Lord in, in Matthew 27, verse 33. And two different times drinks, drinks were offered to the Lord. The, the first time it was offered, uh, it, was, it was a mixture of wine and and gall, which would have made the wine very bitter. And this, this, it was actually, uh, it was actually something that the Roman soldiers would do to numb the pain of the one being crucified. So it was, it was a kind of an act of mercy almost so that they wouldn't be as uh, sensitive to what they were about to go through. It was a narcotic it was a numbing or it stupefied the, the, the victim if they digested this solution. And so they, in, in Matthew 27, verse 33, look, they, they went and they came to the place of Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. But look at this in verse 34. They gave him the wine mixed with bile to drink or mixed with the gall. So they gave it to him to drink. And it says, after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. After tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. So here was what the, this is what the Lord said to me. He said, he said, I've tasted the bitterness, but I refuse to drink it. I've tasted it, but I did not digest it. I've tasted it, but I didn't come under the influence of it. He spit it out. And immediately after this, if you hop to Luke's account, because uh, uh, Matthew's account says that they guarded, uh, they, they divided up his garments right after he spit the, 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 the bitterness out. And in Luke's account, it says he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he, he was refusing He was refusing to come under the influence of bitterness in in light of what they were doing to him. Father, forgive them. His eyes were on the Father. It It was the Father's love through him And then him looking at his father and saying, Father, would not I forgive you, but Father, would you forgive them for what they're doing to me? The the father was the source of this love. Father, would you forgive them for what they're currently doing to me right now? There's, there's, There's something about acknowledging the pain and the blame. Acknowledging, acknowledging, wow, that hurt, and you're responsible for this hurt. Like that's step one in moving towards forgiveness. And Jesus hanging on the cross, the, the soldiers were the ones to blame for the pain that he's enduring. And yet even, even in that moment, he's forgiving those that are causing the pain. It's like a supernatural act of mercy and forgiveness. Uh, 
Let me, let me lead you to one other account of someone that I think modeled forgiveness uh, like few. It's, it's, it's Joseph. Go to Genesis chapter 45. You're familiar with the story of Joseph who was betrayed by his brothers. He had every right to be embittered towards them. Yet, as I started studying forgiveness, I saw the message of forgiveness towards the end of his life, especially towards his brothers. And in Genesis 45, one, he's gonna confront his brothers. It says, then Joseph could not control himself in front of everyone standing before him. And he shouted, have everyone leave me. So there was no one with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Then he wept so loudly, the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. They came closer to them and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold to Egypt. And do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me ahead of you to save lives. This is him presenting to his brothers a heart that had already walked through the process of forgiving them. Can I give you five points to forgiveness really quickly? Okay, the first one, and all of these are in uh, the story of Joseph. Uh, I could show you these in Matthew 18, which is the story of the, the servant that was forgiven much. It's threaded throughout. But the first one, and Joseph does this, he acknowledges the pain and blame. So number one is acknowledge the pain and the blame. Acknowledge the pain and the blame. Joseph says this, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. You did this. You caused me to be here. You're responsible One, acknowledge the pain and the blame. Uh, The second thing in moving towards forgiveness, this is complete forgiveness. Sometimes I think forgiveness is just tongue in cheek. Like, I forgive you. I was like, I do this with my five-year-old and seven-year-old all the time. Get in my office. You sit in this chair. You sit in this chair. What do you do? Okay, what are you going to say? Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? I'm just trying to teach them that a response to the pain is that you forgive. Now, is it on a heart level? No. It's just, okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. Now, can we go back to running around? Right? And I think sometimes we do this when it comes to the pains. We just, yes, I've forgiven him. Okay, but, but, but let's talk about what complete forgiveness looks like. Because if I mention that person's name, it doesn't seem like you've forgiven them. And the way you're talking about that church doesn't seem like you've forgiven them. Like the pain that they caused you, it seems like you've brought that here. And, and inevitably, what, what, when you harbor bitterness, it's a poison to your soul because of the pain, and you're not entrusting that pain to the Lord. Forgiveness is an act of trust. And oftentimes we can't surrender because we actually think we're better at dealing with the pain ourselves than surrendering to the Lord, and that only hurts us. And Joseph wasn't doing this. So we acknowledge the pain and the blame, and then the second thing is we have to identify with the person's humanity that hurt us. You identify with their humanity. You identify with their brokenness. You identify that, that they're broken like you are, that wounded people wound people, hurt people hurt people. And I think he does this by identifying with their humanity by, by declaring, I am your brother. I'm still your brother. Even though you disowned me and sold me, I'm still your brother. And then I also think it's really crucial to see that he says, I am Joseph. The first thing he asks about is his father whom is their father, which reminds me of Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. And one of the reasons I think Joseph learned to forgive or got to the point of forgiving his brothers is that he constantly kept his father before him. So identify with uh, their humanity, number three. So one, acknowledge the pain. Two, identify with their humanity. Number three, you refuse to take revenge. You refuse to take revenge. This happened, I think, when 
Joseph cleared the room out. He told all the Egyptians to get out. Um, I think these associates would have avenged Joseph's wrong. And I think he protected his brothers by removing everyone out of the room. He refused to take revenge. Number four is that in order to go to complete forgiveness, we have to be willing to endure the pain that someone inflicted. So you're acknowledging the pain, you're acknowledging the blame, but that doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the wrong that they did and now the consequences of that wrong. This is probably the toughest one, is we oftentimes think, because I've forgiven, I'm no longer gonna be in pain. But that's not true. (laughs) It's not true. The actions of another have consequences, and sometimes we have to bear the consequences of their actions even though we've forgiven them. This is Jesus. Jesus is doing that. He's enduring the cross, but he's forgiving the ones that put him on the cross as he's dying. <laughs> Joseph, he, he, he had to have gotten to a place, this is a heart that's processed forgiveness. When his brothers are in front of him, he's not giving it to his brothers. His brothers actually in, in chapter 50 are afraid of Joseph. They don't think it, the forgiveness is, is, is thorough. It's, it's finished because after After Jacob dies, the brothers come to him and they're pleading again, hey, are you going to take revenge? Are you still holding a grudge? And Joseph answers him in, in, in Genesis 50. He says, no, no, I'm not. Don't be afraid. I will not. I will not take God's place. I will not sit in God's seat. Joseph had surrendered fully the pain and endured that pain. Decades of slavery, imprisonment, his whole life was defined by their betrayal. Uh, but God used that pain to position him. And then the, the, the fifth thing and the final step to forgiveness, this is complete forgiveness, complete forgiveness. Say complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness is that you bless those. You bless them. You move into a place where you actually can extend blessing to them. You can pray for God's blessing and his best for them. In Joseph's life, he told his brothers that I'm gonna provide for you. He, he, he sent them to the land of Goshen during a time of fam, famine. He changed their current plight and the generations after them. He forgave them. He gave them what they could not provide for themselves. He actually blesses them. He positions them to be blessed. And if you can get to this place, you've truly, you've truly processed walk through the process of forgiveness. And <clears throat> I think this is just a crucial thing for uh, us to know how to handle the pains and wrongs of the past so that they don't show up tomorrow. So that they don't show up tomorrow. Um, in fact, l- look at one last verse in Genesis chapter 50. We love the Bible. Genesis 50. I mentioned this earlier, verse 15. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge? Even though he already told them, don't be angry. This is, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and he pays us back in full for all the wrongs which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father, <laughs> they're bleeding on behalf of the father, your father charged before he, was, uh, before he died saying, those you shall say to Joseph, please forgive. I beg you the transgression of your brothers and their sin for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servant of the God of your fathers. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. In verse 18, he says this, uh, then his brothers came, fell down before him, said, behold, we are your servants. And then 19 is the key. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? Am I to sit in God's seat? As for you, you meant evil against me. But look at the perspective that Joseph had, but God meant it for good. What did God do? He turned the bitter into sweet in Joseph's life. He got a higher perspective. You know, God doesn't cause all things, but God causes all things to work 
for good. God doesn't cause all things, but he causes all things to work for his good, which means the pain of yesterday, today, could provide purpose for tomorrow. Some of the people that are some of the greatest uh, uh, heralds for justice and ambassadors of justice, kingdom justice, have actually faced some of the worst injustices. And it provided a purpose for them, a righteous purpose. But here's what the Bible says. It says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, which means anger can't be a motivator. It has to be a heart that's been liberated from the pain of the past in order to be motivated by love. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to pray for those that need healing in their hearts, need bitterness to be flushed out, that harbored anger towards a situation, a person. Uh, you know, we, we just walked through this. Uh, we did a, a five-week series back in Dallas on this topic. It's probably been one of the most fruitful series we've done in some time. And one of the things that came up over and over and over again is that uh, people needed to forgive God for a situation in the past. They, they, they blamed God for for that. If he is who he says he is, then how could this have happened? It's not that God needs your forgiveness, but sometimes we need to acknowledge our offense towards the Lord. And, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to uproot any bitterness, any anger that's been aged. that the love of the Father, the love of your Father, that it would search you and know you and that, Lord, just with that exacto knife, with your, your, your holy, magnifying glass, searching our hearts, Lord, would you bring up situations or people, Lord, that we need to forgive? Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and liberate? If that's you, if there's just a specific person like you, you, you feel like the Lord's really dialing in on, on, on a moment in time, something that has just been harbored and it's painful and you can acknowledge that pain and you can associate the blame with that person. Could I, could I just ask you to stand to your feet? If, 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 there's a, if there's a person to blame for that pain and that wrong, I wanna ask you to stand to your feet. I feel like the Holy Spirit is gonna really uproot And, and I, I, I feel like one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, but I want to mention it now is, is, is a part of surrendering, part of surrendering that pain, part of surrendering that person, handing them and giving them over to the Lord is is really, is really that you stop talking about it, you stop processing it with other people. That, that you, really, you really fully and wholly give it to the Lord. That there's this closure that comes by you going, you know what, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna willingly endure the pain that they caused. I'm gonna not, I'm, I'm not gonna avenge. I'm not gonna take revenge. I'm entrusting I'm entrusting them to you. I'm surrendering them to you. I will not sit in your chair, Lord. Lord, you have forgiven me. And the forgiveness that you've given me, I'm going to extend to them. The forgiveness that, that I've received, Lord, I know I can give. And I just pray freedom right now for anyone standing up, Lord, that you would, you would sever ties of offense, sever ties with bitterness. Lord, we want to fully yield and surrender to your Lordship over this pain and that Jesus Image Church would be a church 
that's known for this. It's known to keep short accounts. It's known to not harbor offenses. That we won't do that towards leaders. We won't do that towards staff members. We, we choose to believe the best. We choose to see the best. Love believes all things. Love endures all things. Love hopes in all things. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Just as he has forgotten your past, we're declaring, Lord Jesus, we want to surrender the pains of our past to your Lordship. And I just, just declare it. I just sense something in the spirit over Jesus' image that there's a crossing over, that that which has been bitter will become sweet, that this is the place where the bitterness of life becomes sweet. It's going to be, it's going to be an, a, a massive uh, attribute of Jesus' image is that the bitter is turned to sweet. The bitter is turned to sweet. The bitter is turned to sweet that those that have been hurt by religious systems, those that have been hurt by authoritative, just weird, wonky styles of leadership in churches, that this is a place where they will find healing in community, in life, in their hearts, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that you're doing that even now. And for those standing up, I just, just, if you would surrender, just say, Lord, I surrender this person, this friendship, this relationship, this wrong. And that you, you would give them peace right now. Encourage. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There it is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There it is. Come on in, Lord. Break those dams. Break those dams, Lord. Break those dams. Those, those walls, Lord. Break them right now in Jesus' name. Right now that we cut, we cut vows and judgments that we've made towards those people. Vows that say, I'll never talk to them again. We, we just break any vows that we've made internally. And Lord, we receive your love. We receive your forgiveness. And Lord, we extend that. Lord, we extend that. The, the, the forgiveness is a gift. It's a gift that you're giving to yourself. Forgiveness is not trust. Forgiveness is a gift. Trust is earned. If trust has been broken, it needs to be earned. But forgiveness is for your heart. Forgiveness is for your sake. Forgiveness is for your healing. Forgiveness does not make the intolerable tolerable. Forgiveness does not make the reprehensible irreprehensible. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is you saying, I cannot, I cannot make this wrong right, but Lord, I'm entrusting it to you to make it right. And whether you do that tomorrow or in the age to come, I trust that, that vengeance is yours, as it says in Romans chapter 12, that you will make every wrong right. And... and <laughs> Because you're a faithful and righteous judge, you're good at that. It's what you do. And so this is our act of worship today. And we can declare, he who the Son set free is free indeed. That we have been set free. Lord, supernaturally, would you bestow grace upon every heart in this room to not fall short of the grace you've provided for this area in their heart.
keep your eyes closed. I saw the Lord, I saw us, for those of us who have a person in mind, I see them before you. If you can picture them before you. And I see the Lord walking up and standing in between the two of you. And now he's the one that you see. And I want to invite you to make this confession to him from from Exodus 15. You are the Lord who heals me. You are the Lord who heals me. And I want you to just whisper that to him. Because one of the reasons we are afraid to forgive is we don't know what to do with the pain that's underneath there. But Jesus is so big, so capable, so strong, so all-sufficient in his mercy and in his grace and in his strength. What seems impossible to you is completely probable for him. His kindness, his kindness is overwhelming, all-consuming is his grace. And I want you to confess to him, you are the Lord who heals me. You are the Lord who heals me. I can trust you with this pain. I can trust you. You are the Lord. You are the Lord who heals me. This is how we drink, body of Christ, of the sweet water. This is how we spit out the bitter gall and we drink the sweet water of redemption. We drink the sweet water of healing. Drink the sweet water of healing by the Holy Spirit. Oh, drink the water of healing, the sweet water. The sweet water, the sweet water. Look at his face. Look at his face. Look at his precious face. Look at his face. He's so zealous to take away that which is bitter and to make it sweet. Look at his precious face. His face. It's what he paid for. what he paid for. Let him receive the reward of his suffering. Yes. You know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount makes it very clear that that we're to forgive. He He says, forgive others as you've been forgiven. He says, if you do not forgive others, you will not be forgiven. And the point is, to the measure that you've received and understand his forgiveness towards you, you can extend it to others. And I feel like there's an altar call that, that, that some of us have fallen short of maybe God's forgiveness towards us, that, that we need to receive his forgiveness, that we need to receive his forgiveness. You like feel you feel like you feel like you're ninety eight percent forgiven. You feel like you're ninety five percent forgiven, but there's like there's just a small percentage that still remains, and so that small percentage remains towards others. And this morning is about complete forgiveness. It's about you fully and completely receiving God's forgiveness, and you fully and completely giving that forgiveness. It's not ninety nine percent forgiveness. It is a hundred percent forgiveness. It is entirely wiped clean. When you stand before him, he will not remember your past. As far as the east is from the west, he has forgiven you of your sins. And so you need to receive that for yourself. If that's you, if you've been, I feel that's a real strong word about you're like 99% forgiven. You're 90% forgiven. Would you come to the front this morning to receive 100% forgiveness from the Lord? I feel like there's a crossing over 
of coming fully into the forgiveness of Jesus. Like fully into, fully into his perspective, his framework of you and your past. Forgiven, beyond reproach, unable to call into account. And as you receive that forgiveness, you can actually issue that forgiveness. Lord, thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your love and the thoroughness of it. Lord, we've been blood bought. It's by your son's blood. It was at a lofty price that we've been redeemed. And we declare, Lord Jesus, total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. We repent for believing partially. And this morning, we believe fully in your forgiveness and in your mercy and in your embrace. We've been living as a slave in the Father's house. He's saying, get my finest robe. Get, get my ring. Get new sandals. My son, my daughter is here. You are not in the slave quarters. You're not just a worker. You are a son and you are a daughter. He is your father and he loves you and he forgives you fully, thoroughly. Be forgiven this morning. Be forgiven this morning. Be forgiven this morning. <laughs> There's no more condemnation. No accusation stands. You're free. You're free. I believe we're going to take communion. Is, is that when everyone leaves or do they take it now? It's not a better thing to do in this moment than. Thank you, Michael and Lo, for that word. And if you've come forward this morning, I believe there's true freedom for you. The assurance that you're His the full assurance that you're his. So Lord, we just thank you for these lives. Just look at the Lord. Let's just, let's just pray quickly. Just, just pray to the Lord. Just say, Lord, here I am, fully surrendered. Thank you that I'm yours. Thank you that you died for me, that you rose again, that you ascended into heaven, and you're seated at the right hand of the Father, and you're coming back for me. Lord, I believe. I receive your love today. I receive your forgiveness today. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for washing me in your blood. Thank you that it is a new day, that I leave here cleansed in full assurance that I've been bought and purchased by your blood. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Some of you may have been given a pamphlet as well some things that we always encourage you to do as you walk this out with the Lord. And just be with Jesus. Just stay in his presence. Be with Jesus. Just pray. It's praying. It's reading your word. Becoming part of a church. Getting baptized. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Being a witness. Telling others what you experienced today. So we are going to step into communion. We're going to have our ushers come. And if you've come forward and you can go back to your seats, if, if you need to stay, that's okay too. But, but we get to go from this place of freedom into the table and having a meal with the Lord. It's a family meal. And so our ushers are going to come to serve you. 
And as you come forward, they're gonna release you row by row as you come forward and you go back to your seats. Don't take communion alone. If you came alone, join someone next to you. If you've come with your family, receive communion this morning with your family. Worship team, oh, you're already here. <laughs> And then we'll worship. Our prayer teams will come after you if you need prayer. We want to pray with you and agree with you. But there's healing in this meal. He is the Lord who heals. He is the Lord who heals. We're going to pray. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your body that was broken. For our healing. Thank you for your blood that was shed. For the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, I thank you for every healing that is about to take place. Every healing that is about to take place. If you are sick in body, you come to the table this morning in faith that he is the Lord who heals. He is the Lord who heals. He does not change. His word does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there is healing in this meal. We partake this morning in remembrance of what you did, Lord in remembrance of what you did, in faith that you are the God who heals. So we thank you for this meal. We thank you for your body and blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So ushers, you can begin to, to dismiss. We're going to worship the Lord for a while together. Prayer teams will be available after. And just come back tonight. We invite you to come back tonight. It's going to be a beautiful time in his presence. Come hungry for more, for more of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Michael and Jess here. We are standing on the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. A local church, Jesus School, a House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing, and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're going to show you right now. We want to take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County, right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program, yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10:42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into Children's Church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. 
The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.